بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم السلام علیکم ویورز آئی یو ہوسٹ ایس ایم حالی پریزنٹنگ انادر ایڈیشن آف ڈیفینس اینڈ ڈپلومیسی ٹوڈے از اے اسپیشل شو وچ شوڈ ہیو بین ایڈ یسٹر ڈے بیکاز دس از اے شو ان وچ وی آر گوئنگ ٹو ڈسکس دا سگنیفیکینس آف دی ڈیٹ آف ٹوینٹی تھرڈ مارچ بٹ بیکاز آف ایکسٹرینیس سرکمسٹانسز اٹ کوڈ ناٹ بی ایڈ سو وی آر گوئنگ ٹو ڈو دا ڈسکشن ٹوڈے وتھ اے گریٹ ویٹرن اینڈ اے وار ہیرو none other than Air Commodore Sayyid Sajjad Haider Sitare Jurat. Welcome to the show, sir. Thank you. Because let me tell you that he is not only the fighter leader who led the very daring raid on Pathan Court on the 6th of September 1965 and destroyed over a dozen Indian aircraft on the ground, but returned unharmed and continued to fight the war with valor. He gave the enemy a taste of its own medicine again in 1971. He has been very blunt in expressing his opinion. His book, Flight of the Falcon, is testimony to that. So let us bear with him because he is one person who has also sat at the feet of the father of the nation, Qaid Azam Muhammad Ali Jinnah. So I'm sure he's going to share a lot of memories and a lot of lessons. So let's start the discussion with you, sir, on this point. that 23rd March, we pay homage to the father of the nation, also to the leaders, the heroes, and the martyrs who have served Pakistan. What is the significance of this particular date, sir? Uh, <clears throat> if um, I'm permitted, I would like to uh, start with a different thing and come on to the 23rd March. The word, you mentioned the word leader, martyr and hero. All these three words have become an anathema over a period of time. Too many myths, too many contrivations have created uh, the, uh, uh, an image of leader, of martyrs and of heroes. To me a hero is a person who goes into a mission not necessarily war, but a sacred mission in which he believes and in the achievement of the mission and his faith in Allah and for the sake of truth, he loses his life according to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the hadith of uh, our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He is a martyr and this is something that people don't understand. He doesn't have to fall by the sword or by a gun. Now. <laughs> Martyr, martyrdom only lies in the court of God and that is very clearly enunciated by the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that uh, a martyr is decided only by God Almighty upon the intent with which he achieves that uh, highest uh, uh, stat status in life. It's not for touts and, uh, and, and uh, toadies to decide um, at any time they like and then decide who is a hero. Uh, therefore, the, the stature of a hero must be raised with truth. But you know, a famous uh, philosopher and writer said that in this uh, time of uh, universal deceit, truth is a revolution. <laughs> and I think Pakistan, in this whole region actually, uh, we are on a counter-revolution. I think truth is something that we must understand, its power, as God, Allah Ta'ala, Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala has uh, ordained and as the example of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that truth is the most powerful uh, element of human character. But we seem to have gone so far away from it. So who in and your opinion is the real hero to which we Pakistanis must be paying homage to? The real hero which we Pakistanis yeah. need to pay homage so I, to? To my mind, all these things a hero, a leader, and in my opinion, a martyr, all three were in the personality of Qaid Azam, Muhammad Ali Jinnah, Rahmatullah Alayhi. We, of course, have uh, uh, indelible faith in the uh, person of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, 
But let me just share with the uh, viewers something that uh, should stay in your minds, uh, the uh, power of a leader as to what is, what constitutes a leader. And these are the words of a Christian philosopher of the 17th, 18th century. An Italian? An Italian, I believe. And uh, <clears throat> in his book, Historia de la Turquie, uh, Alfonso de la Martin writes, and I quote, Greatness of purpose, smallness of means, and astounding results are the three criteria of human genius. Who could dare to compare any great man in modern history with Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? The most famous men created arms, law and empires only. They founded, if anything, at all, no more than material powers. I hope people are listening to this, especially those who consider themselves leaders. Power often crumbles away before their eyes. This man moved not only armies, legislation, empires, peoples and dynasties, but millions of men in one third of the then inhabited world. And more than that, he moved the stars, the gods, the religion, the ideas, the beliefs and souls. His forbearance in victory, his forbearance in victory, his ambition, which was entirely devoted to one idea and in no manner striving for an empire, never for an empire. His endless prayers, his mystic conversation with God, his death, and his time after death, all these attest not only to an imposture, not to an imposture, but to a firm conviction which gave him the power to restore accord, the unity of God Almighty and immateriality of God. Philosopher, orator, apostle, legislator, warrior, conqueror of ideas, restorer of rational beliefs, of a cult without images, the founder of 20 terrestrial empires and one spiritual empire, that was Muhammad, who sat on the ground and stitched his own shoes and his shirts. As regards all standards by which human greatness may be measured, may we well ask, is there any man greater than he? None. Cardinal Bosworth of a different Christian faith corroborated this, but I don't want to go into it because his is uh, equally <coughs> accoladed uh, thing about this was our prophet. He set the example of, uh, of how life must be lived. And I think close, coming close home, but that was divine. Coming uh, closer home, the one man who followed him, who followed his ethics, in his character, in his integrity, in his honesty, in his vision, in his ability to see and, and know and think that only it's the poor that need the most attention of uh, a leader. And he was a leader that God gave us, that bestowed upon us, Muhammad Ali Jinnah. And he became, he was President Muhammad Ali Jinnah. He, was, he did not like titles and, and, and these big uh, uh, things and so on and so forth. I once asked Ikh Marshal Asr Khan uh, that uh, you s mentioned, sir, to me that when you were traveling to Maripo, uh, to, to Karachi from Maripo, you saw a broken down ambulance and you said to uh, Begum Asar Khan that I think this could be Qaid Azim's ambulance who had just landed at Maripur. With uh, surprise, I asked him, I said, uh, uh, Sir, but why you had any doubt when you received him? Didn't you see the ambulance? He said, no, we were not allowed to receive him. He was, we were, nobody was allowed to ever leave their offices. He said, my secretary, my, my uh, ADC is adequate. That was a leader. That was a man of example. Now, what do you say? Coming back to my original question, sir, the significance of 23rd March. Yes. You see, 23rd March, again, 
I think uh, uh, I was a bit surprised when I asked few people. Uh, they think it's a Pakistan day. 23rd March 1940. It's not a Pakistan day as such per se. Qadi Azam had strategized at one stage in his life in, uh, in 38. And I know that day because uh, at a, on a personal note, I, I was about eight years old. And I know that uh, according to the British history, which I have with me, my father, who was a pioneer of Muslim League in Balochistan, Muslim League of Qadi Azam, uh, and he, according to that book, had made the first speech on the day of deliverance of the Yom Najat that uh, Qadi Azam had broken away from Congress, and the idea of two-nation theory had been floated. It was a succession of two-nation theory that finally found its expression in the resolution of uh, uh, on on the 23rd March 1940, which is known which as the, which is known as the Lahore Resolution. It's a Lahore Resolution, which was essentially Qaeda's strategy that within undivided India, uh, there should be uh, zones and regions with Muslim majority, which will enjoy complete uh, uh, freedom and uh, be autonomous completely. And uh, the details were to be worked out. However, that idea did not sit well with uh, Willy Nehru or with Gandhi, who was a an absolute Hinduetta. I mean, I, I uh, uh, don't wish to say uh, more than this, that he was a very staunch Hindu. And uh, they, that uh, uh, Jawaharlal and Nehru's words to the press soon after they came out of the uh, uh, cabinet commission, that all right, uh, we will see. We are 75% and a democracy, we will see what we do. What he meant was what Moody is doing today to the Muslims. So all those who think that Qadi Azam made an error and those who think that Pakistan's creation was uh, uh, a mistake uh, should now go ahead and go, back, go over to India because this country and this nation was created by this man with the, uh, a jaunt frame but a will and a spirit of, st of steel, forged steel, his determination, his honesty, integrity, his wide vision and his absolute dedication. You think he could not have gone to Switzerland or other places when he was uh, discovered with uh, tuberculosis? But he made this uh, Dr. Dr. Patel swear that he should not announce this. He did not want anyone to know. He could have done that, but he was on a mission and he had to achieve that mission. And he lost his life in the process of that mission. And let me t also share one thing that people, very few people know, that he also gave his assets, which were, he gave, according to what I've read, one crore to Aligarh University, two crores to Sin Madrasa, and one crore to Islamia College, Pishar. With the, uh, con in the condition was that you must educate the poor classes of Muslim youth. If you educate them, you must educate them not for them to get degrees only, but for their moral education, for them to become useful and uh, proud citizens of their country. And if you don't do that, they will turn into brigands and terrorists. And now we see that his words were lost, they were buried with him, his legacy was buried with him, and now what we see, if you go to E7, it is, uh, it is like uh, Afghanistan. Allow me, sir, uh, please share with our viewers you had the honor of sitting at his feet when you were a young boy. What impact did that have on you then and your adoption of the future career of Pakistan Air Force? Yes, it's a, it's a moment that uh, shall resonate in my mind till my last breath. A very proud moment indeed. And uh, <clears throat> this uh, photograph is taken on that particular uh, day when he landed at uh, Samangli Airport. And that evening, I had the <coughs> great privilege along with my young friend, we were both scrawny and jaunt. We carried a sofa for about two miles over to McMahon Park uh, in front of Islamia School, which was my former school. By then I was uh, studying in grammar school. Uh, and uh, 
Uh, that is the sofa on which the kite actually sat for a few moments. Uh, that's a, that's a, 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 a memento of uh, great pride for me. Uh, <clears throat> but uh, we had seen him earlier in the day because for the first time, our uh, principal father Aquino, uh, the, the Irishman, uh, he announced that uh, the school was, uh, uh, the boys were off, boys and girls were off for uh, 45 minutes. Am I that for the students, you know, that's something great. Uh, we didn't expect that. We didn't know what it was. So he said everybody used to line up on the road outside, which is Lytton Road in Quetta. And we lined up, and lo and behold, after a while, we saw this uh, Khan Kalat's uh, uh, car. It was a convertible, and there was Kaid alive. And he had been a symbol of a sage and a saint in my family because of my father being so dedicated, devoted to the Kaid. And that same evening, I was privileged because I was part of the student Muslim League Student Federation. But I'm talking about Muslim League of Qaeda Azam, not these 20 Muslim League that have followed. Uh, and uh, I was a very devout uh, uh, worker of that Muslim League. So I have a, a very tiny, a minuscule part in the creation because this I'm talking about in 1940. Uh, 4, 43, 44, 45. This is the time when we were struggling uh, on the, on the uh, instructions and direction of uh, the Muslim League uh, uh, stalwarts at that time. Uh, uh, and uh, <clears throat> so I had the opportunity to uh, be allowed to sit on the stage. And I was five feet from Qadi Azim's feet. Heard him speak. He was uh, roaring like a lion. In English, there were thousands of people, Baloch, Pathans, Hazaras, but the front rows are all occupied by the school and the young people who had talked in their subjects. Amongst them was a young man who shook hands with Taide Azam four times and took four prizes from him and then made a passionate speech. I will tell you who that was. In Taide's speech, I think that most of the people didn't understand English. But there was pinned off silence. You could hear heartbeats. They were getting the message. They knew he was talking about them. He, they knew that he was talking about the poor of Pakistan. He was talking about the lesser pe um, people of God. He was talking about their future. He was talking about, and some of you will become engineers and lawyers, judges and so on, and doctors to serve the poor, to remove their miseries, to help them away from tyranny. And his last sentence was, and then some of you young men will become defenders of the nation. Now the doctor, to become a doctor and serve humanity, struck a chord with the young man sitting there, who happened to be my young brother, Professor Bunyad Heather, who passed away a year and a half ago and became one of the world's most famous cardiologists who taught thousands of uh, doctors all over the world. And uh, his uh, eulogy by the uh, college is something to be read, that a boy from Islamia school could achieve that. So any Pakistani can achieve that, given the motivation, given the leadership. But, you, be but you became the defender of Pakistan. So I decided at that time, but it took me four years of uh, taking that uh, eye test uh, card that you even see now from my father's clinic, because I was told that your eyes have to be very sharp, the Air Force. I didn't know much more about <laughs> it, never seen an aeroplane. But I used to see these spitfires over, uh, doing mock fights over Quetta, and I used to see the pilots of those uh, uh, spitfires. Mostly uh, uh, they were Polish pilots, and uh, they wore their attitude, you know, the tilted cap, buttons open, and so on. I was smitten. And then I spent those four years in almost like a dream. And God gave me the opportunity to become a pilot one day. And I hope that uh, by God's grace and the courage that he gave me that I was able to perform my duties for this nation. You, uh, did, you did very well, sir. You went beyond the call of duty, but you remain a Ghazi. And the nation owes it to you. But uh, coming back, picking up the thread from where you just left, sir, what impact did the personality of the Qaeda have on the development of the armed forces of Pakistan? Well, 
you know it's a <clears throat> it's a very good question and i think it's a very important question because his legacy i show this book to the nation all those who are listening to this program and i don't think that the ones that i am addressing this to would be interested in this very much because they are in higher uh purchases and uh uh they are not uh followers of that iqbal alama iqbal's thought at tahir e lahuti us rizq se maut achhi jis rizq se aati ho parwaz mein kotahi it wasn't about uh, uh just rizq it was about uh, honesty integrity performing your duty and never being corrupt and then to shahi hai basera kar pahadon ki chatanon mein it meant your mental your spiritual elevation to higher uh, firmament to be able to think uh, with vision to be able to act according to the legacy of the qaid this book the day this book becomes this little uh, booklet that i keep uh, giving to people should be part of the curriculum of every school in this country and every college in this country and those who have given this to they have been some ambassadors some very uh, seasoned people and they have been absolutely amazed this should be the heart of the constitution of pakistan the day it becomes the heart of the constitution of pakistan believe me we are we have taken off so qaid look at the parade that march that you see look at the fighter pilots that come and display which you They must have given, done which you must have yourself performed uh, almost so, uh, there is no event uh, i think after i became uh, a flying officer there is hardly any event a fly pass a demonstration formation or battle anything in which i did not take i had the privilege i was honored to including the world record breaking 16 aircraft diamond formation yes. of the f86s which uh, you set a new world record yeah i i i'm coming to that but the qaid had a vision when he addressed the academy at uh, risalpur april 1948 1948 addressing this uh, handful of pioneers of a fledgling air force with few broken down aircraft his message the other day i read it to uh, i mentioned this to the academy at uh, risalpur which i had the honor to address uh, by the invitation of the uh, great uh, um uh, chief of uh, air staff the present one air chief marshal sohail aman sohail aman uh, a, a very outstanding leader uh, and uh, with a great companion general rahil sharif the two of them have uh, really changed the whole facet of uh, uh, the the impression of the armed forces although the armed forces remain the same they are the only ones who have defended this country they have defended this country because it's because uh, uh, the impression that has been created is totally politicized the reality is not known people are not interested in real history to find out and research as to what really happened so i will lose track but here qaid e azam said <coughs> nation without a strong air force shall always remain at the mercy of an aggressor <coughs> excuse me <clears throat> who was he addressing this to he was addressing it to the nation he wanted people to be aware because he had seen the role of air power he'd seen the decisive role of air power from world war 1 to 2 and then he said pakistan must build an air force and build it quickly who was that addressed to the rulers of that time to give the wherewithal and the resources to the air force and then he said it must be an efficient air force and second to none who was that meant for those people those pioneers sitting there under the command of that one man who followed the qaid e azam's legacy one man i know air marshal asr khan who at that time was wing commander asr khan wing commander and he heard the message it sank in and he beca- it became a raise on the ether for the air force and in the next 8 years he created the most formidable fighting machine which are the words of air marshal noor khan to me air marshal noor khan severely told me 
that only Asar Khan could have created what he did in those eight years. Even I could not have done that. He said that to me. It was very kind and gracious of him to say that. And, but that's a fact because in two years, within two years of taking over at age 36, the first commander, youngest commander chief in the history of the world. And in two years, we had created two world records that stunned the world. And they said this flying club that we left behind, the British were saying, and they had to send a whole team from Flight Magazine to come and see that we had actually performed a loop in close formation in which I had the honor to be number three. It was actually a formation of four that became Falcon 4. That was the first Falcon 4 team, hmm. which uh, <coughs> uh, went on for months. And we performed in front of Mr. Chern Lai. And I had the honor to shake his hand and even get a pat on my shoulder uh, by him. And then uh, Imam Shalasar Khan said, not good enough. Do something more spectacular. The Air Marshal Noor Khan was at that time base commander, Maripur. He said, and it was increased to seven. I must remember with uh, uh, a great uh, tribute to the man on the right in that formation, uh, Alauddin Ahmed, flight, uh, flying officer Alauddin Ahmed, uh, a man of steel who was martyred at Gurdaspur in 65 war. Uh, and it was led by Invincible Miti Masood, who also passed away. I was on the left, and our flight commander was in the field. But then it was increased to seven, and then on to 14. And that stunned the world when this uh, maneuver was performed. Uh, it was, of course, followed by seven, and then four, and so on. Uh, but uh, uh, it stunned the diplomatic corps, and of course, uh, message went through to Americans, and so on, and they said, can't believe that they could do this. So, and soon after that, a Canberra was shot down at uh, 43,000 feet by one of uh, young pilots in my squadron, 15 squadron, flying off to Eunice at a height altitude above the operational height of the F-86, the, war, the war, Korean War F-86. So these were two monumental achievements. And after that, as far as the Indian Air Force is concerned, we have a lot of trophies. Uh, we have Nats, we have uh, Oregon's and all that lying there. So in peace or war, we have beaten the Indian Air Force. And I've been hearing uh, a lot of things and reading some things coming from them, uh, threats, vulgar threats, how they can write off the Pakistan Air Force so quickly because of their numerical preponderance. And all I want to say to them is that I'm not going to make any claims. I just want you to please read your own history, written by your own authors, Pushpinder Singh Chopra, Ravi Raki, and uh, Samir Chopra. They have admitted 65 and 71. In 71, the nation doesn't know this. And please, I want to tell you this. I want to share with you that 71, we shot more aircraft than 65 in a shorter time. And the kills were corroborated in the, under the uh, uh, stewardship of an uh, American uh, brigadier, Chuck Yeager, Chuck Yeager uh, who was uh, uh, requested to be um, head of the team, which would confirm the kills. So the kills of 71 were absolutely. And Dhaka, single squadron against 11 squadrons. And they flew 1,400 missions against Dhaka alone. And they did not destroy a single fighter aircraft, whereas in 65, we destroyed 13 in 10 minutes over Pathan Court. So you see, the, I'm, I'm mixing factors, but I want the nation to know that these people that you saw, the men that were marching, the pride in their face, and the un unity, the sparkle in their eyes, the unity in their thing, and the fire in their eyes, that is what has, is your vanguard. That is what saved you before, that's what's going to save you again. And I think we are well on our way to give the nation a Pakistan that guides, guides uh, soul may be pleased at. So, uh, in hindsight, sir, where do you think the nation went wrong when we discarded some of the Qaeda's legacy? Because we didn't listen to his, uh, his advice. He had fears and he had hopes. He, for example, his main concerns were corruption, nepotism, black market, and uh, bureaucratic uh, 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 tradition, heritage, 
uh, that they had inherited from the British. Red tapeism. Red tapeism. About corruption, the Qaeda said in 1945, two and a half years before creation of Pakistan, corruption is a curse in India and amongst Muslims, he says, especially the so called educated and the intelligentsia now. I would like this to be heard and absorbed. The educated and the intelligentsia. Unfortunately, it is this class that is selfish and morally and intellectually corrupt. Goodness. No doubt this disease is common, means amongst the Indians, Hindus and so on and so forth. But amongst this particular class of Muslims, it's rampant. That was Qadi Azam's declaration. But he didn't know the order of magnitude to which this corruption will go to this day. That the whole world is sitting in absolute uh, uh, shock and uh, awe of the magnitude, order of magnitude. I don't know what's happening to the, uh, those um, um, Obachas and others who are there. But I want to tell you that the other thing that uh, Qadi Azam had uh, <coughs> very con serious concern about was uh, theocracy. He said that the great majority of us Muslims, we follow the teachings of Prophet Muhammad sallam, peace be upon his soul. But make no mistake, Pakistan is not a theocracy or anything like it. Islam demands from us the tolerance of others, creed and we welcome in closest association with us, all those who, of whatever creed, are themselves willing and ready to play their part as true and loyal citizens of Pakistan. And let me go a little further that his concern for minorities, to my knowledge in school and to my experience in the Air Force, I can tell you one thing without uh, any uh, doubt or uh, fear of contradiction that they were smarter than me, they were more intelligent than me, and they were as dedicated and had as much Pakistaniyat inside them as I did or my colleagues did. In the Air Force, from the Air Vice Marshal down to a flight lieutenant, they were exemplary, most of them, 90% were exemplary, they were in all case here and there, but then I'm talking about a large majority. And they were dedicated Pakistanis. They gave their life. They gave their life. They died fighting for Pakistan to defend this nation and defend this country. So, f and then and, and the Parsis. I mean, I uh, speak of uh, one who's a very close family friend, uh, Jim Shed Marker. He was probably the finest ambassador Pakistan ever had. I have seen him in Japan. I've been with, stayed with him in Japan, in Switzerland, and in America. And he enjoyed such dignity and, uh, and, and popularity because he took me to certain receptions and my God, everybody would rally around him because he was intellectually so far above the, the common ambassadorial uh, lot there and he had such a clear vision of what Pakistan, uh, how Pakistan is to be represented. And as a as philanthropist, the Parsis have uh, been uh, the biggest philanthropist in this country, but we brand them away. We ran them away because afraid of the mullah. And the mullah is the greatest threat to Islam, in my opinion. And they have proven that. They were against Pakistan when they were in India. The Khaksars, the Ehrars, the Jamiyat, the Jai, and so on and so forth. They use, they, they use expletives against uh, Qadi Azam Muhammad Ali Jinnah, Rahmatullah Alayh, and against Pakistan. And now they uh, become now the uh, flag holders of Pakistan. What about the Bengalis? The Bengalis played the most crucial role in creation of Pakistan. Because remember, Qaid had a very serious problem. As far as uh, uh, the uh, Indian subcontinent are concerned, there was a disparate uh, millions of Muslims, divided, and then under the influence of these parties, Ehrars, Khaksars, and, uh, and so on, and then the Mullahs. And then there were Abul Kalab Azads and these types who did not want Pakistan, who did not want, who did not like Qaeda Azam, nor did uh, Mountbatten. He 
He was he envy, he was envious of Khan's personality, his uh, integrity, his achievements, because what he achieved, according to um, um, uh, what's his name? Uh, what did Winston Churchill have to say about the Khan? Yeah, Winston Churchill. Winston Churchill had to say that in India, he trusts Jinnah because he will stand by his word, but he does not trust Gandhi or Nehru. And also, British uh, sorry. Uh, Western authors have written that Gandhi and uh, Nehru put together intellectually did not match this one man, Muhammad Ali Jinnah. So that's the leader that we had. Walpert, Stanley Walpert, who has written the um, biography. I was talking about Stanley Walpert that no one in this world history achieved those three things. That he changed the course of history. Who has changed the course of history? Perhaps Abraham Lincoln in some ways. And he created a nation state. Nobody has created a nation state. And he uh, changed the map of the world. How many people have changed the map of the world? But look at his achievements. And what did we do to his legacy? We changed the map of the world in reverse again. We broke the Pakistan, the Pakistan into two. And why did that happen? The question comes to the Bengalis. Uh, if, you, if, you, if you permit, uh, I'm taking a very short break. Uh, uh, viewers will just be back. Some of the world's most fascinating brasswork originates from the city of Peshawar in the province of Khyber Pakhtunkhwa. Brasswork involves engraving beautiful patterns and shapes using traditional methods known as Nakshi to describe sketching and Kudai translated means scraping. Swat is renowned for its woven textiles and embroidered products. While weaving is carried out in many major cities, Swat in particular